Okay, everyone, we're ready to get started. Welcome and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Jason Fisher. I'm a member of the RFS GI service line, as well as the communications committee at SIR. And I'm speaking alongside Matthew Town tonight, PGY3 at Kaiser LA, and the GI service line liaison, who will be presenting some of the seminal papers for upper and lower GI bleeding in IR, following which uh, I'll have a chance to discuss a meta-analysis on glue embolization for GI bleeds as well. It's also my honor to introduce our faculty for this evening. Uh, moderating and providing their insight tonight are Drs. Vivian Bechet and Mona Renate, currently both of the Mount Sinai Department of Interventional Radiology. Dr. Bechet is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania Medical School and subsequently joined the Mount Sinai School of Medicine for both her diagnostic radiology training and VIR fellowship. And Dr. Renate completed her MD at University of Wisconsin, um, continuing on to the Medical College of Wisconsin's Diagnostic Radiology Program and a VIR fellowship at Mount Sinai Hospital. So a big thank you to both of you for being here with us tonight. Hi guys, thank you for having us. So before I turn it over to Matt, I need to remind everyone that tonight's session will be recorded and then subsequently available on the <laughs> SIR IR Education YouTube channel. So be sure to revisit it there and check out a host of other webinars and journal clubs. Also, if you have any questions, uh, please enter them in the chat box on your toolbar labeled questions, uh, and then they'll be saved for discussion at the end of each presentation. Okay, Matt, I believe you have the presentation and the floor is yours. All right. Beautiful, thank you. Dr. Renade, Dr. Bishai, thank you for your mentorship. Welcome everybody. My name is Matthew Tayon, the ESIR resident at Kaiser Permanente Los Angeles. I'm here to talk to you about uh, the role of IR and acute GI hemorrhage. As a basic outline, we'll be discussing upper GI hemorrhage, mostly arterial, variceal bleeds from a venous source, and then lower GI hemorrhage, also mostly from an arterial source. You take a look at this uh, image here, and we can see that we can have bleeding from the esophagus, stomach, duodenum, and up until the ligament of trites, that'll characterize our upper GI hemorrhage. After that, we can characterize that as our lower GI hemorrhage. We'll be discussing these papers uh, by Dr. Naviluri, the role of IR in upper GI bleeding, acute lower GI bleeding. And I also took the liberty to add uh, this article from our colleagues in uh, gastroenterology. Uh, that way we can gain a little perspective of how they manage the bleeds and how it, how it can benefit us and our patients, of course. A little background, uh, upper GI bleed accounts for about 76% of GI bleeding events. Now, when we look at these upper GI bleeds, we gotta consider if they're arterial or non-variceal or venous and variceal in etiology. Um, one of the major problems with these acute variceal bleedings is the high early mortality rate, which can rise up to 30%. Some of the causes include peptic ulcer disease. That's one of the highest majority of etiologies. Mallory Weiss tears, hemorrhagic gastritis, pancreatitis related pseudoaneurysms, neoplasms, hemobilia, fistulas from the aorta to the duodenum, and also trauma. Venous causes usually are due to portal venous hypertension, things like cirrhosis, but Chiari syndrome, or even splenic vein thrombosis. Here's just a little diagram of our suspensory ligament of trites characterizing everything proximal to there, our upper GI bleeds. And sometimes it can be challenging to see on our diagnostic imaging, so I took the liberty to include that imaging here. Here's our uh, jejunum uh, at the ligament of trites area. Here's our duodenum as it transitions to the jejunum, and that correlates with this image we have here. Symptoms. Typical upper GI bleed symptoms, as you have seen before in your clinical practice, is hematemesis or melina, but patients can also present with hematochesia depending on the bleeding rate and transit time throughout the bowel. Patients with variceal bleeding, however, tend to present with clinical signs of cirrhosis, things like painless hematemesis, and they generally have a greater degree of hemodynamic instability. 
leads that have a non seal etiology are more commonly associated with things like coffee ground emesis or uh, NSAID use. Something that our GI colleagues utilize is uh, some risk stratification. We have here the Rockall score, the Glasgow Blatchford score, and the AIM-65 score. And these help to uh, stratify uh, patient risks when it comes to upcoming endoscopy, but they also have some mortality uh, associations. So here's the Rockall score. It incorporates age, shock, other comorbidities, uh, etiology for the GI bleeds, and increased Rockall score can lead to increased uh, morbidities. There's a Glasgow Blatchford score. As the, this, this can be used to help um, rule out the need for uh, urgent endoscopy. So if you have patients with a Glasgow Blatchford score of zero or one, these patients generally do not require hospital admission. They can be safely discharged. They can get their endoscopy in the outpatient setting. And alternatively, we can use this AIM-65 score. This AIM-65 score utilizes age, systolic blood pressure, altered mental status, INR, albumin. And this is particularly associated with uh, in-hospital mortality rates. You can see as the score goes up, you can patients can have mortality rates as high as 24.5, 25%. So once we've risk stratified our patients, the first line treatment for upper GI bleeds would be medical management, stabilize the patient's blood pressure, fluid resuscitate our patients, get a type and cross, get those transfusion of blood products as soon as possible. Um, the goal is a hemoglobin level greater than or equal to seven. Um, and placement of a nasal gastric tube can be helpful to confirm a GI source of bleeding. Here we have a radiograph which demonstrates the nasal gastric tube below the level of the diaphragm in the expected location of the stomach. If, however, uh, you do expect a variceal bleed, an esophageal balloon catheter can be placed to tamponade these esophageal varices. Here we have an uh, example of a Sengstake and Blakemore tube. This is a, a tube that can be inflated within the esophagus. Usually you can inflate to about 150, 200 milliliters of air. Then you pull it back so it's stable in the cardioesophageal junction. This is usually a temporary solution to stop variceal bleeding. It should only stay in for about 24 hours, lest the patient have uh, uh, issues of ischemia. In, when you're dealing with medical management, we, got, we must take into account patients who are on these direct oral anticoagulants. And patients on the DOAX can have a 25 to 30% increased risk of GI bleeding. There are reversal agents for uh, a number of these DOAX, but we often have to get some lab values to indirectly quantify the DOAC levels before we reverse these. So reversal agents such as PCC, activated PCC, idarucizumab uh, can be used. And there's some others which are undergoing clinical trials there's, such as andexanet alpha. Um, in addition, proton pump inhibitors can reduce the rate of rebleeding, reduce the need for surgery and reduce mortality. Uh, even in um, patients with uh, portal hypertensive type bleeds or uh, variceal type bleeds, there's medications that can help, uh, somatostatin, octreotide, or vasopressin. Now, we usually send our patients to endoscopy as an initial diagnostic intervention, twofold, because it can allow for localization of the bleed, but also treatment of the bleed. And via endoscopy, Patients can be treated with thermocoagulation, sclerosin injection, or clips or banding. Uh, our endoscopy colleagues can utilize this forest classification uh, to evaluate the severity of disease and the risk of re-bleeding. And we don't always get the gross imaging that our endoscopy or our gastroenterology colleagues see such as here on these endoscopy images, but 
perhaps it is something that we can increase our familiarity with, especially with more endoscopy being, being used in the interventional radiology setting. CTA, computed tomographic and geography, can be utilized and is very sensitive, up to 90% sensitivity, 99% specificity, and has an accuracy up to 98% in localizing these bleeds. <clears throat> the general protocol is a non-contrast series, followed by IV contrast in an arterial and a delayed phase. And generally, you're looking for hyperdense contrast material greater than 90 Hounsfield units within the bowel lumen on that arterial phase. Generally, you'd want to advise against using oral contrast. So when you're protocoling, just make sure that the oral contrast is not included for these patients because that can obscure IV contrast extravasation. This can have a, these CTAs can be very valuable, but do require iodinated contrast. So this can be limiting for patients with uh, severe renal disease. And they, since it is uh, a radiation study, this can, this got to be communicated to the patients in, uh, when discussing pros and cons of the study. Now, in terms of catheter angiography, uh, it's generally favored over surgery as a treatment of choice if endoscopic therapies have failed, especially in patients who are high-risk surgical candidates. Um, before we do an angiogram, just, ver just verify the patient's renal and coagulation status because oftentimes you do administer a, a good amount of contrast, iodinate contrast, although we will be discussing CO2 angiography as well. Um, so in terms of angiography, we should specifically target the suspected site of bleed. If we have a CTA or a prior intervention on hand, review of that can expedite the cases fantastically. Uh, one thing to consider is the angle of the mesenteric vessels as they come off the aorta. For example, if in this case, the celiac trunk and SMA are not, not too severely or not too acutely angled coming off the aorta, but if you did have a very challenging angle, you may want to consider a brachial approach as opposed to the common femoral artery approach. Just something to consider in terms of access pre-procedure. Uh, an angiography of mapping aortogram can help survey the vascular anatomy before you start going selective or subselective. And oftentimes, uh, contrast extravasation is not visible on the mapping aortogram. Oftentimes, you've got to go bit more selective or subselective to identify the bleeds. You may choose to administer glucagon as well to limit peristalsis, to limit respiratory motion uh, when you're doing these digital subtraction angiograms. And then different catheters can be used. Uh, the author of our paper here was recommending uh, RC1 catheters or VS1 catheters made by Cook. Uh, you may want to try Waltman's loop technique. Uh, but I think something that is highly high yield in this study, in this uh, paper, is the discussion of injection rates. Injection rate of, a power injection rate of five cc's per second for total volume of 20 to 25 can help optimize your detection of active bleeds. We'll discuss the, the value of angiography in terms of bleeding rates here an angiogram can detect bleeding rates as low as 0 0.5 milliliters per minute. And in future slides, we'll discuss the value of tag red blood cells uh, in detecting bleeding rates. When we are performing an angiogram, the primary angiographic finding we're looking for is active contrast extravasation or contrast pooling in the venous phase. But you don't always see that. Other indirect signs of bleeding on angiogram include just identifying a pseudoaneurysm, vessel spasm or vessel cutoff sign, early venous filling, or even just hypervascularity in the region. Uh, here in CO2, angiogra uh, CO2 angiography, it's, it's a very sensitive modality and it has to deal with uh, the lower viscosity of CO2. This low viscosity of CO2 should 
predisposed to extravasating through endothelial injuries. However, uh, in reality or in practice, it may still be challenging to identify uh, extravasation using CO2. Generally, this is characterized as having poorer spatial resolution. But if you are stacking images, stacking your CO2 images, this can help um, in the sensitivity of your CO2 angiography. Uh, in addition, many, many times we do an angiogram and the upper GI bleed is not identified. And this may be due to an intermittent uh, disease process, intermittent bleeding, uh, we may come up with a negative angiogram on our study, even though the patient is symptomatic and still decreasing in their hemoglobin levels. But this study demonstrates that no statistical difference in outcomes is shown when patients are treated empirically. Our patients are embolized empirically versus embolizing only after angiographically demonstrating contrast extravasation. What this is trying to say is that if you're in location highly suspected for a bleed, but you don't demonstrate definite contrast extravasation, you still may be able to perform empiric embolization and help the patient. There's different types of microcatheters that can be used. You know, this is really dependent on the facility you practice, but a renegade or a prograde microcatheter uh, can be used to get selective. Uh, let's see, furthermore, something to consider is uh, vasospasm and vessel tortuosity. When you're trying to embolize, the goal usually is to get both distal and proximal embolization. But oftentimes those aforementioned vasospasm and vessel tortuosity may prevent you from getting that uh, distal catheterization. In that event, in the event that you do undergo vasospasm, you can either wait it out and let the vessel regain its caliber, or you can infuse 200 micrograms nitroglycerin into that affected artery. This is particularly important because vasospasm can mask bleeding in the target vessel. And if you administer your 200 micrograms of nitroglycerin, you can go ahead and reveal that bleeding. <clears throat> but Interestingly enough, if an artery has undergone vasospasm, it may reveal bleeding in an adjacent vessel. So there's pros and cons to, to having the vasospasm. Now, in terms of embolization, there's no definite evidence that say that one embolic agent is superior to the others, but there are multiple agents we can utilize. We can utilize coils, gel foam, particles, glue, and Jason will be discussing in depth the use of glue for embolization. Uh, we can utilize coils, and the author was recommending a gel foam sandwich in which he alternated between coils, a slurry of gelatin sponge, coils again to form a gel foam sandwich. And this can help decrease the amount of coils utilized, but also expedite the embolization. Uh, you know, something that's very interesting is that uh, oftentimes these patients are sick. They may have had prior surgeries, multiple comorbidities. And when you're dealing with embolization, embolized vessels can recanalize in the period of weeks to months, and they can form collateral vascularity. But in patients who've had prior surgeries, such as Whipple procedure, they have altered vascular anatomy, and they may not have the collateral circulation that a patient without surgery may have. In cases like this, the gel foam may be, gel foam embolization for a GI bleed may be recommended over things like coils uh, because the patient does not have as much collateral circulation. Uh, when you're, you can also utilize particles for embolization. Uh, keep in mind that the, the goal here is not necrosis of the bowel. We are really just trying to alleviate the increased arterial pressure or uh, decrease the bleeding, but without causing organ necrosis. <clears throat> I'll leave the, spe the specific glue talk for Jason. And then in terms of the upper GI system, upper GI bleeds, the vasopressin, uh, not so effective, but 
it is quite effective for lower GI bleeds, and we'll discuss that shortly. Lastly, after you have successfully performed your catheter angiogram, we got to make sure the patient is well cared for. So if the patient is on aspirin, it can be resumed, but after discussing with the rest of the multidisciplinary team, just got to verify that the cardiovascular risks outweigh the risk of re-bleeding if the patient's on aspirin. Furthermore, there is a known interaction between proton pump inhibitors and clopidogrel. And even despite that, it still may be valuable to start the patient or continue the patient on a PPI, uh, even if they are taking uh, aspirin or Plavix. Outcomes, what are the outcomes? Once we have successfully embolized the patients, well, Generally, technical success is up to 93%. Clinical success, 67%. And you may have up to a 33% rebleeding rate <clears throat> that may require repeat embolization. Uh, one study even documented that upper GI bleeds can be more resistant to hemostasis than lower GI bleeds. So that would be something to consider uh, when go going into the procedure. And last but not least, a complication rate of about six to nine percent. These complications can go from you know, low-grade complications to high-grade complications. You can have access site hematomas, arterial dissection, contrast and empropathy due to the amount of iodinated contrast used, non-target embolization, and even bowel ischemia or infarction. Next, we'll discuss variceal bleeding, as we said earlier, is due to usually elevated portal pressures. When you're dealing with these variceal bleeds, uh, something to keep in mind is that the risk of re-bleeding is high in these variceal bleeds um, unless they are treated. Here we have an example of a cirrhotic liver portal vein that demonstrates some portal hypertension causing some splenic varices, some esophageal varices. Here on this coronal MIP, we can identify those esophageal varices as well, gastric and esophageal varices. Uh, in terms of endoscopic therapy, still these can be treated with sclerotherapy, variceal band ligation. However, in about 10 to 20% of the patients, this can fail to control the bleeding. And things like portosystemic shunt creation may be necessary. Here we have an example of varices originating off the portal vein, and then subsequent creation of a portal systemic shunt and flow preferentially diverted into that shunt and no longer filling those varices. And the goal is a portal systemic gradient less than 12. This is associated with a lower risk of re-bleeding. You can, also, I, you can also perform balloon-occluded retrograde transvenous obliteration, BERTO, coil-assisted retrograde transvenous obliteration, CARTO, or even plug-assisted retrograde transvenous obliteration to block off these um, varices. Basically, what you're doing is placing a balloon, a coil, or a plug to control the blood flow and help with sclerosing, help with uh, uh, the embolization of those varices. But, you know, we can't just jump in and just embolize or block off the varices. Truly, if, if we're gonna be successful with these transvenous obliterations, we gotta understand each patient's unique anatomy, identify the hemodynamics. Where's that blood flow going in this particular patient? Uh, moving on to this last section, acute lower GI bleeds. Anything distal to the ligament of trites can be characterized as a, generally as a lower GI bleed. Overall mortality rates for these is two to 4%, and they do account for one to 2% of hospital emergencies. 15% can present as massive life-threatening bleeds, and 5% may require emergent surgery. So it is something that really is affecting the patient population. Now location, you can characterize these as either the small intestine or the large intestine. And common causes for small bowel bleeds include enteritis, neoplasm, AV malformations, ulcers, trauma, whereas in the colon, 
in the large intestine, you're mostly going to be dealing with diverticulosis or angiodysplasia. Uh, what I liked about this article was this very in-depth algorithm, simple, but to the point. If you have a lower GI bleed, generally, as with the upper GI bleed, start with medical assessment, medical management. Push forward with a colonoscopy. If you can, if you can achieve hemostasis with a colonoscopy, go back to observation. If it, re if it recurs, restart again with the medical assessment and management. If in colonoscopy, you are unable to achieve hemostasis, take them to diagnostic radiology to assess the localization, to assess the etiology of the bleed or to localize the bleed. If you can localize the bleed, undergo endovascular embolization or surgery. If you cannot localize the bleed and they're hemodynamically stable or unstable, that will be a, a branching point. If they're hemodynamically stable, then perhaps you can take them back to observation. Take them back to observation if hemodynamically stable. However, if not, even if you have not localized the bleed, you may want to take the patient to endovascular uh, diagnosis and therapy and or surgery. Now, in terms of localizing a bleed, no single lower GI endoscopic technique can see the entire length of the uh, lower GI tract. Colonoscopy limited to the colon, terminal ileum. You can use double balloon enteroscopy. That only show about 50 to 120 centimeters proximally within the, the jejunum. Uh, you can do retrograde double balloon enteroscopy, but that still is limited in its reach. Furthermore, you, you can do a capsule endoscopy, and that can visualize the entirety of the small intestine. Very sensitive, very specific, but doesn't offer an intervention specifically, but it does help you localize the bleed. This is, demonstrates the limitations or the strengths of a colonoscopy and helps to identify all different etiologies of a possible bleed. This is something you may see when interpreting a small bowel capsule enteroscopy, double balloon endoscopy. These are the tools that may be utilized. And as we mentioned earlier, we foreshadowed nuclear medicine, a tagged red blood cell scan can be very helpful. It can detect bleeding rates as low as 0 0.2 milliliters per minute compared to 0 0.5 milliliters per minute for angiography. And something that's very helpful is that it can be utilized to evaluate the bowel over a multiple hour window, therefore increasing the sensitivity. Here's an example of a positive tag red blood cells scan. We have accumulation of radio tracer outside the blood pool. And if we continue to watch it, it should be moving within the lumen of the bowel. Embolic agents are very similar to upper GI bleeds, coils, gel foam particles, glue, with the similar risks and benefits as we previously described. But something that's very helpful in lower GI bleeds and it can be very successful is vasopressin. Vasopressin not so effective in upper GI bleeds, but can be successful 60 to 100% of the time in lower GI bleeds. And in cases where embolization is not technically achievable, if patients have tortuous vessels, vasospasm, vasopressin infusion, should be a consideration. However, it is contraindicated in patients with coronary artery disease, cerebral vascular disease, because these conditions can be made worse due to the uh, vasoconstricting effects. And lastly, a collaboration with surgery. Either patients can go for acute surgical evaluation or we can help, we can still offer assistance to a surgical team by injecting a Methylene blue via catheter placed fluoroscopically. So there's a, it's always a special role that interventional radiology can place, whether it's uh, knowing the medical management, endoscopic management, endovascular management, or even the surgical management. All right, thank you, everybody. Appreciate your attention and your 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 time. All right, Dr. Renate, Dr. Bechet, um, the floor is yours for any of your commentary. Perfect. That was a very good job, um, Matt. Um, basically, it's a pretty broad overview of 
management of GI bleeds, and I know we cover a lot of topics from arterial extravasation to variceal, you know, bleeds and variceal embolization, and really the management of them is really, really different. Um, so Vivian and I both, um, as you guys were going through the presentation, made notes of certain things that we think that as trainees, um, it's very important to have these things clear in your mind so you can really talk and educate the patient, their families, other referring teams or people that are consulting you for a GI bleed when you're trying to set up a case and manage these cases. And I'll let Vivian kind of, uh, you know, basically go over some of those things with you right now. Yeah, um, absolutely. As as Mona said, I mean, um, one of the most important things really is, you know, that and you you touched on this map, but um, doing this in a multidisciplinary fashion, right? So, um, at a tertiary care center like Sinai, you're working with critical care. They're evaluating the patient, um, you know, kind of simultaneously. GI is, you know, consulted. Uh, we are, and you know, if it's determined that. Um, it's an upper GI bleed, then GI potentially would go in first and scope and kind of determine whether it's potentially variceal versus arterial. Um, and so there's a lot of steps that happen really before um, the patient necessarily gets to the angio suite table. Um, critical care is, you know, very important, and it's important that you talk to them about the significance of resuscitating the patient um, in, you know, a very robust way, so making sure the patient has an A-line, you know, what we call lined up, that they have um, multiple units of um, RBCs, um, platelets, depending on, you know, what they're, um, whether they're coagulopathic or not, and whether they're a liver patient or not, um, that they have central lines, and that, you know, they're not coming down in any kind of um, extremely unstable fashion, that they've been fully resuscitated, um, and this is also in conjunction with anesthesia, that you're evaluating the patient and, and doing the cases. Um, so, you know, if GI, if it's an upper GI case and GI goes in and they scope, they'll be in touch with us and they should be in touch with you um, about what they're seeing, uh, whether they feel like they can gain control over the situation, um, and that, you know, if they can't, you can let them know, please either place a clip if it's arterial, you know, and they see, say, an ulcer and they're instilling epinephrine, but they don't, they're not able to gain, you know, complete hemostasis at the end of the case, it's helpful if they, you know, place the clip. Um, the other thing I want to talk about really is the importance of CT angiography in the decision tree. So um, for us here, and I think overall, you know, national trend is really moving away from going into any situation blind. I think that's kind of one of the, you know, worst things you can really do. Um, you should have a preoperative plan in mind based on um, some kind of imaging, and the CTA really does help both in planning and then also intraoperatively. Um, if you're not, you know, seeing a positive angio, you can, uh, there's a lot of, you know, advanced sort of uh, software you can use to fuse the CTA and potentially um, treat prophylactically even if you're not seeing extravasation on the angio. Um, but also in patients that you're not familiar with before and you don't necessarily know if they have altered vascular anatomy, um, which was a great point uh, that you also made, really important to get the CTA because if, if they have had some kind of surgery in the past, then you're, um, everything from the start of the discussion, whether, you know, you're involving surgery when you're, you know, consenting either the patient if they're able to or the family, you're having a completely different discussion and you're not going in blind to a situation when the anatomy could be completely different. So um, I think that, and there's a lot of other reasons that we can get into, but um, in terms of access and how you choose your access, for us, we don't particularly go brachial unless it's needed, but not, not really for GI bleeds. You can reach everything from a radial access, but in determining whether the patient is a better setup for radial versus femoral, like the CTA helps as well, looking at your access site. So for all those reasons, we really start with the CTA, particularly in lower GI bleeds, um, and almost require it. It's quite unusual. I'd say, nine, what would you say, Mona, nine, at least nine out of ten yeah. cases, if not more, we're getting CTA. Yeah. They also reduce the, con the volume of contrast that you're using overall. I would argue that it reduces radiation because, you know, you're not in the room looking for a needle in a haystack. You have you already to work know. with. You can essentially almost pick out 
You have a roadmap for where you need to be. And also, I think, despite the fact that GI is involved in a lot of these cases and will scope the patients and may place a clip, but a lot of times having that CT to establish what the patient's anatomy is and despite what they see, sometimes the bleed is coming from multiple sources or not what they saw because a lot of times they'll see an ulcer with some uh, a clot associated with it but no real bleeding vessel or no active extravasation and what someone might think was the source of bleeding may not be and you might find out when you're actually doing the angiography and so you end up wasting a lot of time um, you know, and a lot of contrast trying to figure out what it is that's bleeding and so having a CTA absolutely will reduce your time, will reduce the amount of contrast used because then you can just go in to that you know, source vessel and embolize it. So in a way, it really helps to have the CTA. Like We cannot basically emphasize enough how much you need that CTA, despite, I know you guys talked about CO2 angiography, and CO2 angiography has its place, but really it's very limited when it comes to identifying a source of bleed and the, you know, talking about the rates that we use and all of that will come, especially depending on what, sort of vessel you're in, the 5 for 25 is the most standard for visceral. Sometimes you have to do a little bit more to, you know, allow yourself to see the bleed, but CO2, even though sensitive, it still has its limitations, especially with patients moving or, you know, bowel gas and contrast in the bladder. There's so many other things that can happen at the same time where you might not identify where the bleed is. So having that CTA really reinforces, you know, what you need to see before you go ahead and embolize. Because, yes, embolization can save a lot of lives. And for the most part, there is really great collateral supply, especially when it comes to upper GI bleeds, like the article said. But you still are, you know, capable of causing ischemia, especially if you embolize with, you know, other than coils, if you're using liquid embolics, which we do a lot of at Sina, and we have a very, very good um, response um, because we use so much of it. But if, you know, if you're using it and if there's reflux and ischemia is a real um, complication, so you really want to know your anatomy really well. So I agree with the CTA. Um, you also touched base on uh, tag red blood cell scan. Yes, having some sort of scan, having some sort of idea of where the bleeding is coming from is necessary, but um, I think these days we just bring the patient to CTA. Yeah, directly. I would argue that it's somewhat of an obsolete study and, and that it can be used in patients, say, that are having recurrent bleeding and then we're not seeing it on CTA and, you know, they're, say, transfusion dependent when they're having their bleeds and it's sort of a diagnostic conundrum. In those cases, you could potentially go to a tagged RBC or, or do the tagged RBC in conjunction with the CTA and kind of look for, like, a vascular malformation, you know, of some kind. But outside of that, in the acute setting, um, it's almost too sensitive and it's obviously not specific at all. Um, so you may have a positive bleed on the tag RBC, um, not to mention how long the scan takes. I mean, if you're really lo looking at a patient who's in an acute GI bleed scenario, um, you really probably want something that you can almost scan them and get them onto your table after they've been resuscitated fully. So, um, but, you know, if often it'll be too sensitive in that they'll, it'll identify a bleed because it can identify much lower bleed rate, and then you're not actually seeing anything on the angio. So if you can't intervene on it, in a way, it's, you know, it's not that helpful. Whereas the CTA, there are studies that show that there's like a very high correlation if it's positive. And when it's negative, it basically excludes like active, active bleeding. So, um, so we kind of, that's definitely part of our decision tree. And then just to touch on CTA, uh, CTB, obviously for varus field bleeding is imperative because you really do need to know the um, portal anatomy, you need to know the contour, which vessels, um, you know, are supplying the um, area of bleeding, if it's esophageal or gastric, you need to know if the um, portal vein is thrombosed, um, what the hepatic vein contour is like. So in those, that a lot of 
you know, preoperative planning should go into it if you're um, if in any way able to uh, before you go into those cases. So, And no matter how unstable the patient is, if the patient's, you know, unstable to be brought to CTA and then they're unstable to be brought to IR, and those are the patients that we're seeing, especially in a GI bleed setting. So it's very, very, very important that we stress that you need to get some kind of pre-op imaging because you have to have an idea of what you need to go in with because there's, I mean, we haven't even touched the subject of variceal bleeding, and there's so many different things that you have to consider, the sizes of catheters, what kind of, you know, embolic agent you want to use, if the patient requires a TIP versus a BRTO, that's a, that basically, um, you know, should have a own if you <laughs> webinar of its BRTO, own. Yeah, I mean, exactly. If they don't have a splenorenal shunt, then you can't do a BRTO, so you need to know that going in. Um just going back to arterial bleeds, so we talked a little bit about, um, you know, what we do for upper GI bleed. A lot of times you'll see that you're also consulted for bleeding um, AVMs, um, small bowel AVMs, which is technically could be considered upper GI. Um, and for a lot of these bleeding AVMs, the standard of, you know, care or first approach has been surgical in the past. And a lot of times we would say, you know, this person should go to surgery, but IR sees these patients when they're really critically ill, like they're losing a lot of blood and they're, you know, pressure dependent and they're very, very sick. And in that acute setting, a lot of times you're going to have to come in to basically stabilize the patient. And in that setting, and I'm glad that we're doing the next paper on glue so that we can talk a little bit more about it, but you know, using liquid embolic for something like small bowel AVMs because even though it's a GI bleed, but the ideology of the bleed is almost like a arteriovenous malformation, it's treated a little bit differently. And I'm really excited um, that the next paper that we're talking about is glue embolization so we can talk a little bit more about that in the use of liquid embolics in GI bleeds. The only last thing I just want to mention, I want to echo what Mona said about, um, you know, interventional radiologists in this day and age, especially if you're in a large center, you you have to dictate the way you're caring for these patients. So um, what you need is not determined by another specialty, right? Like um, if they say a patient's too sick to come down for CTA, they're too sick, then they're too sick for the angio table. And I would say they should be stabilized. You can, of course, you can coordinate it to have the angio done, the CT angio, and then bring the patient over to the table. But that argument of no, um, we don't want to give them contrast and their renal function. If they're in a state where you know they're so unstable from bleeding, then you're going to have to weigh that against the renal function. And in fact, you're going to end up using less contrast if you get the CTA. So. Um, it's important to have those discussions with and kind of move the other teams in, an, in a direction where they understand where you're coming from, that you're doing it for the patient. It's not because you're trying to delay care and come in later, but that this is actually, in fact, and educate them why um, these are the things you need, you know. And uh, so if someone says, oh, no, you don't, you don't need that, that's, I'm sorry, you're, you're a surgeon, you're an interventional radiologist, you don't just determine what the surgeon needs, so they shouldn't really determine what you need. All right. Excellent. Thank um, you so much, guys. Yeah. <laughs> to the next, uh, unless you guys have any questions or anything. So we're going to jump into a, a little bit of discussion on the glue so we can get your guys' opinion on that um, afterwards as well, and then we can always address the rest of the questions. I have a couple lined up here from our audience. Oh. Um, so for our second half, I hope everyone can see this. Does this look like it's showing up? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so for our second half, we're going to discuss the article, Transcatheter Arterial Embolization of GI Bleeding with N-Butyl Cyanoacrylate, um, aka glue. Uh, this comes from Dr. Kim and team at the Department of Radiology, Asan Medical Center in Seoul, South Korea, and was published in JVIR volume 28, April 2017. So quickly, if we can describe this glue uh, and we can get a better sense of why, why this is needed in the literature today. Uh, MBCA is a, a liquid embolic. Uh, I believe it was initially approved for use in cerebral AVM treatment. Uh, and some of its properties have probably made clear why that was the case. 
as a liquid, it, it can be delivered via smaller microcatheters than some of our solid products, uh, though I'm not sure how true that is still today. Um, and it can also flow into smaller and more tortuous vessels, um, as well as malformations and things that might be hard to access. But this is paired, you can imagine, with a disadvantage of controlling its distribution. If you're talking about um, placing a liquid inside another flowing liquid system, it obviously requires a lot of expertise to make sure it winds up where you want it to be. So non-target embolization is probably most people's major concern uh, compared to more hardware-based embolics. But NBCA itself is a polymer um, rather than a glue in the typical sense. And when it contacts an anionic um, solution, much like blood, it polymerizes on itself. And so it adheres to itself rather than the vasculature in the walls. Uh, forming more of an occlusive cast than actually gluing itself inside the vasculature. Now, after this, an inflammatory reaction follows and eventually leads to fibrosis. Uh, NBCA safety was recently demonstrated in visceral pseudoaneurysms in diagnostic and interventional imaging by Juan et al. in uh, late 2015. But with the management of GI bleeds, many studies have gone about showing the safety of NBCA and its use. Um, but our authors tonight point out that there's a lack of consensus on the choice of embolic as well as their situational advantages or disadvantages. Uh, so in this way, uh, meta-analysis was the perfect tool for them in order to synthesize a larger pool of data and, and sort of purposefully demonstrate uh, the safety of NVCA and its, its efficacy in stopping GI bleeds. Uh, so we should touch on meta-analysis in general. This is an approach used to derive a weighted estimate from the results of a number of similar studies. And the goal being to increase the statistical power compared to any of usually smaller individual studies. Um, but the fact that these studies included uh, are similar is most crucial because this is where you're building the foundation for the pooled results that you want to show. Um, and we're going to see some of the steps that the authors take great care to include uh, to make for a particularly robust review on the topic. So if we move right into our manus manuscript, I wanted to start out with just some quick highlights because the density of some of the numbers in the middle section we're gonna see can make it easy to sort of lose sight of the clinical objectives that we want in reviewing this paper. So working backwards, we're gonna see that NBCA is comparable with standard techniques in GI embolization. We'll see it brings with it variables that predict both an incidence of rebleeding as well as 30-day overall mortality. And we'll also discuss some disadvantages the authors face to using this type of study and, and hopefully be able to carry that forward when we read and, and work uh, by ourselves in the future. Um, the study starts out with a thorough literature review. Um, and the methodology for doing so is searching via Medline PubMed and Embase databases between 1990 and 2016. Um, and then initial screening was performed to immediately remove case reports, review articles, uh, letters and editorials. Uh, and standalone conference abstracts. Um, the full text was evaluated against uh, a whole series of selection criteria, but mainly these included non variceal bleeding, treatment with embolization and BCA, uh, NBCA embolization alone, or in conjunction with other embolics. Studies that were published in English with greater than five patients uh, had no data included in subsequent articles and the presence of extractable data for the authors to use. And you can see some of the sample um, reasons that many of the studies were lost in exclusion. Um, it's important to note that the review was performed independently by two experts in the study and a third reviewer was used to discuss any discrepancies. Um, and after an initial search led to 288 unique articles, uh, screening whittled that down to 34 papers, uh, of which 15 were chosen against the complete selection criteria to work with. Um, this is a list of many of the um, demographics extracted in the study. Some of the most important, though, are the site and etiology of bleeding. Specifically, we're going to look at upper versus lower and uh, coagulation status in the patient, devices used, NBCA versus NBCA and hardware, um, and then technical and clinical success, which are defined by occlusion of the target vasculature on the technical side um, and a lack of rebleed within 30 days being clinical success. Uh, the authors also use the SIR uh, clinical practice guidelines published here. Um, to indicate major complications in any of the studies. And they use that to pull out some of the um, complication rates and then mortality data. Um, from a trainee level, I'd like to point out some of the quality measures that I pulled out when I was going through this study that are important to keep in mind. Um, the reviewers independently use this NIH quality assessment tool for case studies. 
the outline of which you can kind of see here. Uh, they also use the preferred reporting items for systematic reviews and meta-analysis or PRISMA guidelines, uh, which is a much longer checklist, but very thorough and includes many items that should be addressed to create your own thorough review. Um, the full list is pretty extensive, so I didn't include it here, but it's definitely something to look into. Here you'll see number six highlighted, are outcomes defined valid and consistent across the studies? And you'll see this is the most common interval for lost points in the scale with the studies in, that we're gonna look at tonight. Um, however, all papers ended up getting ranked between good and fair uh, with good inter-rater reliability, which we'll touch on. Uh, first, we need to understand two statistics to really interpret the main results of this study. Um, in determining clinical success rates and complication rates of the pool data, the authors um, look at variation between the studies in a number of ways. So this includes standard things like confidence intervals, but also the heterogeneity, um, which we'll see labeled as the variable I squared throughout the study, um, and the publication bias, which is inherent when you're looking at a larger pool of data. So for measured heterogeneity, rather, um, you're gonna see this displayed as a percentage between these four categories, zero to 40, um, indicating it's not likely important, 30 to 60 for moderate, 50 to 90 indicating substantial, and anything from 75 to 100% for the highest level of heterogeneous data. So there's plenty of overlap here, and you can see this a bit of a subjective interpretation uh, to some extent, but we're gonna use it to kind of evaluate the outcomes um, and the, the regression analysis of the 15 studies that we mentioned. And then publication bias, this is gonna indicate whether or not uh, the decision to distribute a study that one might complete is influenced by the results in the study. Um, this can be important, especially in meta-analysis where you're gathering such a large sample of the literature. Uh, these studies, if publication bias comes into play, may have been published, let's say, with all positive results, and that might skew the new pool of data that you're creating in one direction before you even have a chance to analyze it yourself. Uh, so in other words, it's just as important as making sure that you're matched well on all the usual variables, like age, gender, uh, whatever you're looking at. Uh, so you can see this indicated here by capital P and is considered significant at any value less than 0.1. So that's a lot for just two simple variables, but they're gonna come up again and again, and, and that should be enough that we can jump into the results. Um, as we mentioned, they started with a pool of 288 studies uh, and ended up with a remainder of 34 eligible papers. 19 were removed for many of the reasons we discussed in the first couple slides. Uh, leaving 15 full criteria studies. Uh, this value added here, kappa, this is Cohen's inter-rater inter reliability statistic, uh, where a value of one would be complete agreement. And here we see 88%, which is near perfect agreement between the independent raters on the decision of which studies should be included. Uh, and as we mentioned, all those studies were rated either good or fair, uh, ranging between four out of nine to six out of nine for fair, and seven out of nine to nine out of nine in the NIH uh, questionnaire. And here the inter-rater reliability was around 72%, uh, which is indicated as substantial. Uh, out of these articles, they pull a 506 patients and wind up with 440 working patients after removing, removing bleeding that was either non-GI origin, uh, originated in a GI varix, um, or patients who didn't receive NBZA. Uh, many of the demographics are shown here. Um, as a reader, I originally had some concern over the distribution of gender, where you see here 73% men and 27% women. Uh, however, it turns out GI bleeding is certainly more common in men in the population, and several you know, large 700 plus study, patient studies seem to show that a ratio of about three to two is average. So this is not far off from the population at large. And so since this is Journal Club, I just thought a, a salient point would be made that if you read something that seems off, it, it very well may be, so go and look it up in other sources. And if it is, there are plenty of ways in publication to bring attention to it. And it can be amended or addressed as needed. And that's one of the cool communal aspects to being involved in scholarship, in my opinion. Um, so just to give us the outline of the last few couple of numbers here, uh, 261 patients had upper bleeds, while 179 had lower, about 40%. And we'll see uh, the most commonly identified cause of upper GI bleeding was ulcer at just over half and in lower GI bleeding, diverticulosis was the most common at 30%. And about 35% of patients in both group uh, were identified as having coagulopathy, and that's gonna come into play in our conclusions and discussion. Uh, we touched on endoscopy in Matt's presentation, 
And here the authors just make note to point out that 75% of the upper GI bleed patients underwent a failed attempt at endoscopic treatment, while only 26% was true for lower GI bleeding. Uh, moving on to just look at the outcomes of these cases, we're gonna speak firstly on the upper GI bleeds, then move to the lower, and we're gonna present each category in the, in the same way as we go through. So 99% of the upper GI bleed patients saw technical success. 80% of these cases were achieved with NBCA alone. So no additional hardware um, in terms of coils, plugs, whatever you might wanna use, just NBCA. Um, and in the 19% who did experience a clinical failure, rebleeding re -bleeding occurred at a, a median time frame of about two days. Uh, roughly 2% of patients experienced a major complication, the most common being ulceration. And while four out of five of these were managed conservatively with complete recovery, there was one mortality identified following a subsequent duodenal perforation um, and frank sepsis. Of the upper GI bleeding uh, cases that achieved technical success, there was about a 20% all-cause mortality, uh, about 8% of which 21 patients was uh, bleeding specific. And moving on to lower GI bleeding in the studies, technical success was similar, about 98%. 93% uh, of those patients received only NBCA, and this translated to an 87% clinical success and 5% complication rate. Uh, bowel infarction in this cohort occurred slightly more often with five patients, um, and then ulceration in three. However, all eight patients recovered. Um, three did undergo subsequent bowel resection to correct the infarct and 30-day all-cause mortality was 19%, reduced to 2.3% uh, bleeding-specific mortality. So we're gonna jump into the meat now with the meta-analysis performed to kind of try and elucidate the meeting of, of those clinically successful cases. Uh, so here looking only again at the upper GI bleed, there was clinical success in, achieved in 210 patients. And across the studies, the heterogeneity in those results was 42%. So that places it in the moderate range we mentioned earlier. And the, stu the authors rather show that this is mainly due to this study here, Huang 2014, um, which evaluated only patients in unstable conditions. So defined as a blood pressure less than 90, systolic, uh, and having ongoing transfusion needs, um, even on pressors. So by excluding this study, the authors show a drop in that heter heterogeneity from 42% down to 12%. Um, and a small uptick associated in the, in the clinical success. Um, but here they want to look at the publication bias across those studies uh, to see whether or not there was any initial skew. And it's determined here to be 0.08. Uh, remember that less than 0.1 is considered significant. So to see the, it, the effect of how significant, authors looked at the clinical success again after adjusting for the publication bias. And they saw it drop to 73% from the original 82%. Uh, again, indicating that this was a significant amount of publication bias across these um, 12 to 15 studies or so. But despite this drop, using that 73% number, we're gonna see that squarely in competition with what would be considered traditional methods. So we're gonna look at the exact same properties now for the lower GI bleeding group uh, out of a pool of 175 per, uh, patients, 152 or 86% saw clinical success. Heterogeneity in this group was shown to be zero across these studies. Uh, indicating significant similarity in their outcomes. And the publication bias was 0.9, indicating essentially zero. And we'll see this with a minimal change when adjusting for uh, the publication bias that was present from 86% down to 85% clinical success. Uh, so now we're gonna look back at the upper group, uh, but in terms of complications rather than successes. So we had about a 5.4% major complication rate and in terms of complications, heterogeneity across the studies was also zero. And publication bias does come into play again for the upper group where uh, P was 0 0.06 here. The bias led to a deep, or increase rather in the complication rate to 11% from 5%, so uh, about double. And we're gonna again compare that to um, what might be considered standard across all embolization in our conclusions. So across the lower GI bleeds, they had a little bit higher of a 6% complication rate, uh, a small amount of heterogeneity at 4%. And uh, this was significant. This was pretty robust to publication bias, so no significant bias, and the complication rate rose minorly on adjustment. Um, I'm going to speed through some of the rest of this here to keep us on track. Um, 
but the authors then jump into their regression and 30-day mortality analysis. Uh, so the authors found that only 117, or about 26% of the patients they found across these studies, had extractable individual patient data. Now that's obviously a huge problem uh, if you're looking at only a quarter of your patients having data to do um, mortality regression on. They were able to bump that up to about 70 per 70% of patients, however, by contacting the authors directly uh, and having them put forth the data. So it really goes a long way in terms of um, completing your study to reach out to people like this and try and pull data where you can instead of just running into the barrier and, and uh, not having somewhere else to go with it, I suppose. Uh, just to compare the groups, we can see that they're well matched on age and gender. Uh, however, the site of bleeding uh, was 68% upper GI compared to 38% uh, in the, the excluded patients versus the included patients, that 70%. Uh, and lower GI bleeding made up about 31% of the new group for 62% of the excluded patients. Um, the only other major point to mention here is that coagulopathy also differed. Uh, in 33% of the regression group, it was persistent, uh, while 49% of the excluded patients had coagulopathy. So that 33% here is fairly close to the 35% in the uh, initial patient pool. So out of this new 307 patient group, uh, we then saw a clinical failure rate of 17%, 30-day uh, mortality of 19%, and a bleeding-specific mortality of 7%. Uh, regression analysis was then performed and, and highlighted the coagulopathy factor as the only independent predictor of clinical failure in these patients. So with an odds ratio of 2.2, uh, it's possible to say that having a coagulopathy, some type of coagulopathic process, might be a predictor of uh, clinical failure or rebleeding within 30 days. And in the discussion, we're going to talk about why that's important specifically with regard to glue. Um, there were three other factors determined to be predictors of 30-day mortality, not just uh, clinical failure. The site of bleeding had a ratio of 2.7, uh, coagulopathy again at a ratio of 1.9, and any clinical failure occurring, any rebleeding within 30 days had an odds ratio of 6.7 um, regarding 30-day um, mortality rates. So there's the, the meat of this article, and it's definitely a lot for a few slides, but we need to sum it up in terms of that clinical context. Uh, so we're going to turn to our discussion for that. Um, and to summarize the main findings, we can point to, uh, point to four major results. Uh, the cases where technical success was achieved, the pooled success in the upper GI bleeding was 82%, and major complication rates were 5%. In patients with lower GI bleeding, there was 86% success and 6% complication rate. Next, coagulopathy was shown to be an independent predictor of clinical failure for a patient with an odds ratio of 2.2. And finally, three endpoints were predictors of 30-day mortality, coagulopathy, uh, site of bleeding, and clinical failure. So as with any article you want to discuss, we should give deference to not only these results, but highlighting the inherent weaknesses or strengths of the project. Uh, some of the strengths inherent here in the project were this comprehensive statistical method that the authors put forth. It was very thorough, uh, and it built off a very thorough literature review. Uh, some of the critiques, however, you probably noticed as we went along, uh, inherent in any meta-analysis, the authors carried forward many of the criticisms of the studies that they used. All uh, included articles were retrospective case studies, they included relatively small samples individually, uh, and we pointed out that a number of them had missing areas of data, even though a lot of this was collected um, on the back end. Uh, also, these defined outcomes across the studies were not standard. We saw that in their NIH quality assessment scales, that, that question six. Um, so follow-up data was also a little bit sparse. Most of the original articles only recorded data through hospital discharge, because remember, they were retrospective series uh, as somebody was looking back at charts and review. Uh, so this leads to an underreporting of anything that could be considered a late complication. Particularly, um, the example was given of uh, induced ulceration, but also things like intestinal stricture, or even also ulcerations that wouldn't have been caught in that patient's later hospital course. Um, fourth, there's a substantial publication bias, and we talked about why that uh, may skew some of the interpretation you want to make. So let's look back at the conclusion data just once more, uh, but this time with comparison. So here are the clinical success. We saw 82% in upper GI bleeding and 86% in lower GI bleeding. Uh, these were shown to be similar to those for coil embolization, which are reported between 65 and 75% for upper, 
and 88 to 91 for lower. Uh, we see that clinical success in lower is only borderline outside of that reported data. So you can take that with a grain of salt. Uh, and these groups are also similar to clinical success for embolization on the whole at 51 to 82% for upper and 65 to 86% for lower. Um, looking at major complication rates, upper GI, which was 5.4% and adjusted up to 11%, almost double after publication bias, and lower, which was 6.1, adjusted to 7. These are both well within the range for reported arterial embolization in general, uh, which is up to 10% and in upper GI bleeding and up to 12% in lower. So the authors suggest here that while a risk of ischemic complications is certainly a large concern, uh, the occurrence may be no higher than any other common products. And like anything, a, a user expertise is obviously the driving factor. The lack of long-term follow-up here, however, does mask possible late occurring complications like we, mess it, like we mentioned. Um, so GLUE demonstrated no increase in clinical failure rates when it was used alone and suggests that MBCA used in conjunction with other methods, uh, say on top of coils, for example, may not lead to any further reduction in recurrence. Um, the rate of clinical failure in the coagulopathic patients was 34%, well below the 45 to 64% reporting for the arterial embolization in general. But uh, this suggests that rebleeding with GLUE may be lower. However, there's no clear delineation whether this recurs from this recurrence occurred from recanalization uh, of the embolized sites versus the newer vasculature. Um, furthermore, the coagulopathy itself being an independent predictor of clinical failure when using NBCA alone uh, contradicts the notion that because it doesn't rely on the patient's cascade, remember we talked about how it's an inherent polymer, uh, that kind of combats the risk of recurrence in, in coagula coagulopaths, right? If you're not trying to activate part of their cascade, which is already failing for one reason or another. Uh, but based on the data here, we see that that could be a bit of a misnomer that certainly deserves additional investigation uh, and would flesh out the literature a bit more. Um, and I think that's all I'll have for you on MBCA and its use in GI bleeds. Um, but let me first give a sincere, sincere thank you to all of our faculty, uh, Dr. Renata and Dr. Bache, uh, having these attending mentors, having you guys here and participate in projects like this is really crucial to the RFS, but it really makes for uh, great outreach and learning materials for the trainees too, especially when you can look back and see these on things like YouTube. Uh, and thank you to everyone who stuck it out for the presentation tonight. I know we touched a uh, touch over nine o'clock, um, but we can certainly still go over any questions for the panel if they have time. Uh, and, and if not, I can certainly field any on, on the paper and uh, we can spend a few minutes dealing with those now. That was excellent. Um, you summarized the whole paper really well, Jason. Um, thank you for having both of us. We have a few um, points we want to make about using glue, because obviously if you've followed us on Twitter, you know Mount Sinai is all about radial first and all about glue embolization. And it, it's more than just for pretty pictures that we post on Twitter. It's usually, there's a lot of advantages to glue. And the reason that we prefer to use it is because when we see a lot of these patients, um, a lot of them are in DIC or they're coagulopathic. So they may not naturally just have low platelets, but it's because of, you know, the GI bleed that they're having and they're losing a lot of their blood and they're not adequately resuscitated and their body goes into this, you know, basically a consumptive coagulopathy. And in those cases with patients with INR of, you know, five or more or platelets that are really low, um, glue embolization basically allows us to still go ahead and treat these patients effectively, um, especially because, as you mentioned, the glue polymerizes as soon as it hits blood and doesn't really depend on your body's coagulation cascade to um, form clots or to have successful embolization. The other point I want to make is with the issue of rebleeding, a lot of these patients, when they come to IR, if they are not adequately resuscitated or if they are on pressors, um, a lot of them are uh, have vasoconstriction when we're actually performing the procedure, in which case, you know, you may not actually see active extravasation at the time of the case, and you can do um, empiric embolization of the vessel that you suspect is bleeding, but a lot of these patients open back up when they're a little bit more stable and you know, they can have rebleed. So that there is some confounding factors when they talk about the issue of rebleeds. And I'll let um, Vivian kind of go over a few points she wanted to mention as well. Um, yeah, you know, we have, in our experience at Sinai, have 
you know, over the past five, six years have shifted over to kind of a glue first approach to both, I'd say both upper and, G and lower GI bleeds. Depending on some scenarios, we may use it in combination with coils. But, you know, the patient population that majority that gets, you know, has GI bleeds or variation on the theme, they typically have either some coagulopathy or maybe they're elderly and frequently have some kind of cardiac arrhythmia where they're on a DOAC. And so we're seeing and we're able to actually treat. And the point I wanted to make is that I think it makes it a bit of an unfair comparison because being able to use glue where it, it opens up the possibility to treat so many more patients that you may have you know, said no to, oh, no, you have to get the INR down to, you know, so-and-so before we can safely go through the groin and even use coils to effectively, you know, embolize something. So we're we're treating so many more patients now that weren't necessarily candidates even for, you know, too sick even for embolization or um, so that it, it makes it tough to really directly compare um, glue to other embolic agents for GI bleed. Um, but what we do know is that we're not seeing any increased rates of complication from it. Um, you know, there's obviously a pretty steep learning curve to it, but there's a lot of flexibility in what you can do with it. So if you have tortuous vessels, you can modify your um, your glue ratio, make it thinner to potentially have it, um, you know, percolate forward further into a smaller branch than you're even able to reach. Um, and so it, it allows a lot of flexibility in how you're treating um, any kind of bleeding, really. So we use it in all, you know, trauma cases. We use it often for variceal bleeding in combination with other sclerosis and things. But it really is a very, very helpful tool in patients who can't uh, clot themselves. Um, and so that in conjunction with, you know, radial often in these patients who have coagulopathy has allowed us to treat many more patients. The other issue is cost. I know a lot of people in training are not really thinking about this, but when you get into practice, you're thinking about the cost of coils, and a lot of times using these things, um, other embolic agents are, you know, can add up and can be fairly expensive, as well as the amount of time that you take to basically do a lot of coiling to really get, you know, a good coil pack in there so that you're getting good thrombosis. Um, maybe a lot of time as well as a lot of material that you end up using glue, which the authors mentioned there's two. There's Trufil, which is the more expensive of the two, and then there's Histocryl, which is pretty cheap. So if you're using, if you know what product you're using and you can use either one of them with good clinical success, you're basically driving down the cost of your procedure as well, which, you know, obviously in a bleeding situation, we're not really looking at it as much, but if you're doing a lot of bleeds, then you'd, you know, want to consider that as something um, that adds to your... Particularly in those very, you know, again, those coagulopathic and the, you know, patients, yeah. you really are trying to achieve a coil pack that, you know, very is dense. not, yeah, and is not relying on, you know, thrombotic um, aspect of the coil, but an actual pack. So you'll end up using more. It'll take more time, and those may be sicker patients. Um, you know, start to finish, if you know where the bleed is with, with glue, you know, it can be as little as 15 minutes from the time that you access. So, um, Especially if you have your CTA and you've planned your case before you get into it. Yeah. So bringing back to full circle, get a CTA, consider radial approach. Glue is always a very viable and a good option in treating GI bleeds. And there are courses for all this stuff. So if you're at a center that isn't necessarily doing radial, you know, there are courses and it, it, it is extremely safe if you have, you know, good training in it. So I would just stress that as well. I think that's all for us, Jason. Yeah. Thank Excellent. you. Thank you. Thank you. That was awesome. Absolutely. I'm, I'm really happy we came full circle with it between going back to the preliminary studies, the timing and access choice and I'll brought it back together at the end to kind of see how in practice all of these things together really lead you to manage these patients uh, in a multiple, multidisciplinary way, but at the end you're responsible for their intervention and all those things have to be running through your mind. So I hope everyone took that away from it. Uh, Matt, I don't know if you have any last thoughts um, to go ahead and, and say to the audience. Otherwise, I think we'll wrap it there. All right. It was a pleasure, everyone. Thank you. Thank you guys so Thank much. You. Thanks for having us. All right. Goodbye. Bye. Bye, everyone.